Most of us are born into this world only to become captives of politics and dogma, killing the nomad within. Travelling is addictive and once again we're on the road to get our fix. As a husband and wife team, we like to go places that will never make it onto any travel agent's list of preferred destinations. The globe has already been charted by valiant explorers throughout the ages. But during the last 10 years, our modern world has seen dramatic change that has created new frontiers to explore. Well, I'll wait, Peter. On a previous visit to Pakistan's remote northern areas, my imagination was fired up by what lay beyond when one of the locals, as we arrived at a junction in the road, pointed to the dusty trail going north into high snow-capped mountains in the distance. This, he said with a look of reverence, was the Karakoram Highway. Ever since that time, I kept dreaming of one day travelling up this road into the vast unknown of China. At the border post on top of the Kunjerab Pass, I get the first glimpse of the huge Chinese security machine when our small party of passengers is joined by this soldier. His duty is obviously to keep an eye on all of us, but his drowsy vigilance soon mutates into full-blown slumber. Tashkurgan, situated on the grassy plains across the mountains, is the first town that greets you on the slow descent into the barren Tarim Basin desert expanse. This featureless rural garrison is a place to leave as quickly as possible after a fretful night and an expensive dive before taking a seven-hour bus ride to Kashgar. A comprehensive network of Chinese buses, although often dilapidated, cover large distances remarkably well. Due to the extremes in climate, Tajik nomads have developed these unique homes called yurts to live in. For now it's hot, but temperatures can plummet to as low as minus 40 degrees Celsius, and these thick felt walls serve as a barrier against the elements. A yurt is most certainly not something that can be bought readily in shops. Every part of the structure is handmade by Tajiki families from the hair and wool that they get from their camels and sheep. Although bulky, they are portable dwellings that are supported by wooden frames lashed together by handwoven bands, creating an unsurpassed balmy coziness. The Uyghur people, a national minority, inhabit the greater part of the western Chinese province of Xinjiang. They are one of 55 minority ethnic groups, making up 7% of China's 1.2 billion people. Han Chinese constitute the remaining 93%. Having little in common with the Han Chinese, the Uyghur, who are followers of the Islamic faith, have distinctly different features and customs, and their own Turkish-related language. In an effort by the government to upgrade the poorer western provinces, Kashgar is bristling with wide boulevards dissecting the more modern Chinese parts of town. Large-scale projects are steadily replacing old buildings with new ones. But Kashgar still remains, at its core, a medieval city. During the 1966 to 1970 Cultural Revolution, Muslims were prevented from wearing their caps and many of their mosques were burnt, killing scores of people. But that has all changed and today, at its westernmost outpost, Kashgar is the heart of Islam in China. <laughs> With 
With a history that spans over 2,000 years, it was once an important hub along the Silk Route. Strategic oasis towns like Kashgar served as stepping stones through a notoriously harsh and barren wasteland. Here, exhausted traders and their pack animals could shake off the ghosts of possible death and desert demons that accompanied them on every trip before attempting their onward journeys. The total Uyghur population of Xinjiang province is around 7.2 million. An estimated 5.7 million Han Chinese people who are encouraged by the Chinese government to relocate here form the second largest group. As their numbers grow, the Uyghur people are threatened within their own territory. The best way to escape the oppressive heat is to sip chai or tea on the balcony of some tea house and watch the world go by. Situated on the edge of the fierce Taklimakan desert, Kashgar can be blisteringly hot in summer and it's impossible to imagine how anyone can even entertain the thought of covering their heads in thick brown veils. Not driven by the ferocious materialism of the West, people here lead simple lives. And if a shave is needed, you trust the local barber not to slit your throat with a fancy cleaver. Undoubtedly the most vibrant market to be found anywhere in the world takes place in Kashgar every Sunday. It lasts the whole day and the first to arrive are the ice merchants. They need to find buyers before the unforgiving sun reduces these fragile blocks to muddy puddles. It takes about a week to produce one block and the merchants are justifiably eager to sell. Throughout the morning, droves of people arrive ready to haggle and bargain until dusk. Tried and tested over many hundreds of years, the event is well ordered and divided into different sections, with the animal market attracting the largest crowds. It's also a meeting place where ideas are shared while you fuss over your flock to make sure that it will attract good prices. A good fat-tailed sheep will cost you the equivalent of about 50 US dollars, but this price will slip lower as the day wears on. For those who come by donkey cart, these donkey parking areas are available to park your transport. Donkeys are naughty when left alone and are either looking miserable or are making others miserable. It is at times like these that the donkey parking attendant must act firmly to quell dissent and whip some ass. But probably the most stunning thing to see are the handmade carpets that arrive in huge bundles. They may take up to two months for the village women to make and are aimed at local buyers. The Taklimakan Desert forced the ancient Silk Road to follow two courses, one around the northern rim and one around the south as it connected up the rest of eastern China with Kashgar. On the southern road, about 500 kilometers southeast of Kashgar, lies the town of Hotan. I decide that having come this far and seen part of the area that this much fabled route passed through, I had to try and find something that would make it real, some tangible evidence of its past existence. So I set off with my newfound friend Elvis in a friend of a friend's car on a mission to find handwoven textiles and if luck was on our side, the very stuff that the fable is made of, silk. Elvis, who lives not far from here, decided to bring me to this carpet factory, the largest in the area. <laughs> is this a government cooperative? Is this run by the government? Yes, yes. It's under the government. Yeah. Yes, Botanic yeah. government. Yeah. 
Everything seems quite mellow, but I'm curious to hear from these girls how they feel about working here. I was, I, I was studying at school and then I, I wanted to keep continue and my family had no money because they were poor people and then I couldn't pay to school and then I came to learn carpet waving so I feel very sad. I couldn't go to college, university and so I lost my future, she says. It feels as if her tale was repeating itself over and over as I glance around at the other ladies, and I again realize how lucky you are if you have choices in life. Later I'm taken by one of the girls to her aunt's house, and I cannot believe my good fortune. Whoa, whoa, whoa. These women are still processing silkworm cocoons in much the same way that previous generations used to. The cocoons are immersed in hot water to dissolve the glue that binds them. Then a few filaments at a time are gathered and fed through various eyes in the contraption. One cocoon, apparently, can produce a single strand of one kilometer in length. Whole communities are involved in home-based silk production. You get your cocoons from your neighbor, who cultivates the caterpillars, and then you sell your reeled off bobbins to a small family of weavers down the road. <laughs> These long threads, or warp, that will eventually become a rare piece of silk cloth called ikat, is being prepared prior to dyeing. To resist the dye during the dyeing process, the threads are tightly bound with plastic, according to a pre-arranged pattern. The blurring of the pattern that bleeds into the background is the characteristic trait of ikat cloth. After the initial tying, untying and retying to get different color variations, the weaving process is straightforward. The Roman and Chinese empires developed at about the same time in the second century BC, yet only vaguely knew of each other. Later, when the Silk Road connected the two, silk made its way to the Romans, who were completely intrigued. Not knowing its origin, they thought that the Chinese harvested silk from trees. The Chinese empire closely guarded their secret. During a daring move in 440 AD, better known today as industrial espionage, a Chinese princess smuggled out silkworm eggs in her hair when she was married off to the king of Hetian. This led to the first established silk production outside the Chinese empire in present-day Hotan. How much are they, Elvis? Are they a set price per length or...? Six and a half metres, 300, 350 quite. It's enough for a long skirt for ladies. Elvis and Sissai also visit another carpet factory on the other side of town. Although much smaller, it was the same as the one I'd already seen, and I couldn't quite fathom why he was so adamant that I should come. He introduces me to this man, and as they chatted, the penny dropped. Elvis has an eye on his daughter, Tokshan. While they bask in each other's unspoken, though clear enchantment, her family eyes us with friendly suspicion. Him being 30 and her a tender 15 doesn't seem to be too much of an obstacle. Her father, though, has set her dowry at 10,000 yuan, or 1,200 US dollars. But will she really marry him? Yes, I do, she says. Sadly, he doesn't have the money and is worried that someday soon a rich, uncaring man will take her away. Plodding camel caravans along the Silk Road have been replaced by tar roads and air-conditioned sleeper buses. As the sole means of transport for most people, the buses do long distances throughout China and will stop anywhere to pick up more passengers.
Often such stops become peep shows into humanity with people needing to find toilets that aren't there and hawkers peddling their wares to make a buck. The satire invariably ends with emotional greetings and someone crying as the bus departs. As we all settle in for the 16-hour journey that lies ahead, I cannot shake off the strangeness of what we saw in Hotan. Propaganda blaring loudly over loudspeakers mounted on lampposts, underscore haunting dreams replayed in slow motion. Starting just before sunrise, this is what people wake up to each morning. It was a night that felt like two long nights joined together by a hundred dusty detours, and it was a relief to stretch legs and eat. But the torture is prolonged by a rude cook and a dodgy breakfast. The other guests seem less bothered as they slurp their food. It was time to head into the desert. Merchants travelling the Silk Road needed some way of communicating with one another for protection against marauding gangs. By constructing these beacon towers with mud and straw over 2,000 years ago, they had what was their equivalent of the information superhighway of today. Smoke signals could be relayed from one tower to the next by burning dung on top of the towers that lay strategically dotted along the way. The Jade Gate lies roughly midway between Xi'an, which was both the start and finish of the Silk Road in the east of China, and Kashgar in the west. It was through these high portals that laden camels had to pass for taxes to be collected. Plenty of grass and water was available for the enormous caravans that sometimes could be a thousand camels long. Also about 2,000 years old are these eroded remnants of the Great Wall. Like a snake's tail of mud and straw, it starts here, with the head 5,000 kilometers east on the Yellow Sea coast. The Taklimakan Desert has many secrets. Buddhist monks, supported by merchants, excavated temples along the Silk Road. Later, Buddhism was replaced when Islam spread the same way, and many of these treasures were destroyed. Fortunately, others were claimed by the desert and lay hidden under centuries of sand. The Taklimakan Desert, meaning go in and you won't come out, kept its secrets until the turn of the 19th century when some of its riches were rediscovered by Western explorers who took many newfound artifacts out of China. The Turpan Depression, lying within the Taklimakan Desert, is at 154 meters below sea level, the second lowest point on Earth after the Dead Sea. Turpan enjoys the dubious honor of being the hottest place in China, with temperatures ranging between 50 degrees Celsius in summer to minus 30 in winter. Ancient agriculturists supplying the Silk Road with these grapes found that their best source of water lay far off in the mountains where glaciers fed the streams. Wells at the base of the flaming mountains tap into the large supply of subterranean water, which is fed through a total of about 1,600 kilometers of tunnels. This water tunnel system is known as Kare's irrigation, and although it demands intensive upkeep, is still very much in use today by grape farmers.
As the farcical payoff to a bad joke, Aiding Lake sits in the middle of the Turpan Depression. It has very little water, but for as far as the eye can see, its shores are encrusted in layers of salt. Extreme temperatures that often reach 65 degrees Celsius turn evaporating pools of water into crystal manufacturing plants. Many people ended up here during the Cultural Revolution as workers in salt factories and never left again. The factories have since closed down, but these two men have stuck it out. For them, there is no other way of earning a better living than the 40 yuan or 5 US dollars per metric ton that they can get for these abundant but hard-won crystals. As I travel further east, in the footsteps of the ancient caravans, I find more pieces of the Great Wall. Intended as a defence against hostile invaders, many people still wrongly believe that it is the only man-made object that can be seen from outer space. The truth is that only relatively small sections, scattered along its 5,000 km course, still exist today. Were it not for the tourism industry, it might have already disappeared altogether. Chinese bus depots can be hell if no one understands you and you feel like a trapped animal as you struggle to get the proper bus ticket at the right price. These buses will transport almost anything and although they are scheduled to depart at set times, they only leave once they are full, preferably only when they are extremely full. <laughs> Most roads away from the more prosperous urban areas are in bad shape and are sometimes even washed away by floods. This can cause traffic jams the size of small countries in remote valleys. This particular one didn't move for about six hours. It felt like a mobile town waiting to go somewhere and the strange thing was that no one seemed bothered at all. Even our rooftop companions were quietly sitting it out. Some of the people inside the bus slipped while others managed to smoke the bus blue by keeping most of the windows shut firmly. When the bus did eventually inch forward, it got a puncture that created a flurry of activity and an enjoyable talking point. Spitting is big in China. Apparently 26% of all deaths are due to respiratory related diseases because of the high levels of pollution. The Chinese feel that spitting cleanses the body but seem oblivious to the revulsion it causes. During the cold winter months, pneumonia and other lung illnesses snowball exponentially with every indulgence of the sickly habit. <laughs> the Chinese government has only recently started caring about environmental issues and tightening up on anti-poaching laws. Judging by how often one sees exotic dead creatures for sale, it's hard to believe that there are many animals still alive except in extremely remote corners of this huge country. Menus in restaurants are mostly only available in Mandarin and it becomes a serious problem to order food that won't make you recoil in horror. Any animal is fair game for the Chinese who are known for their outrageous culinary preferences and ordering food can become tricky. Market restaurants often have large holding tanks filled with slimy creatures for deviant tastes and as long as you avoid staring into those big eyes, you're fine. While these men play for shots of rice wine, I wait with bated breath for the food to arrive, hoping that it would be something familiar. This time it is and I'm happy.
Shakha, nestling in the valley next to the Dashya River, high up in the mountains of the Gansu province, is the most important Tibetan Buddhist monastery town outside Lhasa in Tibet. Labrang Monastery is home to about 2,000 Gelukpa or Yellow Hat sect clergy and resident monks. The town itself supplies most of the needs of the monks, farmers and semi-nomadic herdsmen who come from the surrounding grasslands on pilgrimage. The fashionably exaggerated sleeves of the men's jackets come from a time when they were symbols of wealth and leisure. The monastery was built in 1709 by the first so-called Living Buddha, but was closed during the Cultural Revolution when large numbers of monks were killed and many of the temples pillaged and destroyed. In 1980, the monastery was reopened under the watchful eye of the government, who imposed strict control on the number of monks allowed back. As is Buddhist belief, prayer wheels are spun clockwise to symbolize how man revolves around Buddha in the same way that the planets revolve around the sun. As the wheels spin, scrolls inscribed on them release invocations that help the pilgrim on his path to enlightenment. Pilgrims in need of extra merit do repeated prostrations as they follow a sacred circular route or kura clockwise around the perimeter of the monastery complex. After 200 years of constant addition and restoration, a few stormy periods and a fire in 1985, the Labrang Monastery has evolved into what it is today. Currently there are six institutes of learning which include esoteric Buddhism, higher and lower institutes of theology, astrology, law and the Institute of Medicine. Operating in much the same way as Western universities, these colleges have the equivalent of degree courses, some of which may involve up to 15 years of intensive study. It is revealing to experience the intact spirit and innocence of people who have had to endure so much hardship from merciless oppressors. On the eve of our departure we are treated, as if by magical intervention, to a glorious full moon lighting the path of devotees and accompanying them throughout the night. Out in the Sanko grasslands the next day, I visit some Tibetan nomads who live in handmade yak wool tents that are comfortable, big and easy to transport. Terang, who lives here with her husband and her young son, uses some of the collected yak dung to fuel the fire that she cooks on, while her husband is out grazing their yaks. While her son Tenzin plays outside, she's preparing food on the earthen stove that divides the tent in two halves. During winter, the family will normally sleep here, huddled around the low stove for warmth. The living space is rudimentary and practical, with the only ornate feature being the colourful Tibetan Buddhist shrine, decorated with various pictures, yak butter lamps and offerings of food. Barley is the staple diet for these people, and the recipes are normally uncomplicated, but nutritious. Milk, yakum, female yak butter, and the sugar and the wheat. Yeah. It is called a nyok. Yeah. <laughs> Yaks are their version of cows and supply most of their food, fuel and clothing needs. By utilizing the few possessions that they have to the fullest, they have learned to keep life simple. 
With the men out tending the animals during the day, the women will normally keep themselves busy by making butter or spinning wool. I can hardly believe my luck when Serang hauls out her tools and while Tenzin carries on with his schoolwork, she demonstrates the art of spinning wool to me. <laughs> and when do they do this? In winter? Any time. So winter summer here is Unexpectedly, the rain comes, and I'm amazed at how effectively the tent stands up to it. They welcome it when this happens because it saves them a trip to fetch drinking water that is far away. Later, when the yaks return, I get the chance to see them up close and can barely conceal my smile at their stubby calves and strange coats. <laughs> Is this for to hook on there? Mm. And you stand? Ah, oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Where the people of the so-called minority groups that we had come into contact with were warm, open and friendly, I start noticing that the Chinese people are infinitely more reserved, never giving out more than guarded looks as the train heads for Xi'an, the provincial capital of Shanxi province. The tranquility of the western parts of China is behind us and I can feel, as we move east, that we are entering greener, much more populated areas where mostly Han Chinese people live. Xi'an is a large metropolis that was, at one time, both the departure point and end destination for the great trader caravans on the Silk Road. It was also the capital of the Chinese Empire for a total of 1,100 years. Where I come from in South Africa, these beasts are vermin, but here their ambivalence as both pests and choice tidbits can be unnerving. Xi'an lies in the middle of a fertile region that is known as the Cradle of Chinese Civilization. Throughout the ages, scores of civilizations and dynasties settled here. The discovery of this underground terracotta army in 1974 by farmers digging a well shook the world and instantly turned Xi'an into a world-famous landmark. Each of the estimated 6,000 soldiers is a unique life-size replica of the real thing in baked clay from the Qin dynasty dating back to 210 BC. Pingyao, roughly midway between Xi'an and Beijing, further northwest has some of the last remaining examples of true Chinese architecture and was declared as a World Heritage Site by UNESCO in 1997. The whole town has a fortified ring wall around it and four giant gates that could be securely closed and bolted when needed, which managed on several occasions to keep hostile invaders out. The wall even has scars of a Japanese bombing attack from 1937 when they overran eastern China as evidence of a tumultuous past.
Not many days go by in Pingyao without some sort of celebration going on somewhere. Weddings, the opening of a new business, the arrival of a child and a multitude of other occasions will trigger the most amazing explosion of noise and colour. But there is harmony in all the chaos if you were born in this exquisite living museum packed tightly with people. For those with more sensitive ears, there is the welcome escape of a bike ride along the top of the wall. It doesn't take me long to come across these poor animals cruelly cooped up in agony. They're obviously kept by pitiless people who need them to grow into adult foxes that will be slaughtered for their fur coats. This unhappy scene, I felt, is symbolic of a nation that seems prepared to cash in their natural resources for money. Although seeing the foxes is sad, it must be said that cruelty like this is universal. Chinese medicine is a very mysterious subject for most Western people. When Dr. Li invites us to her clinic, I have mixed feelings about what to expect. No one here speaks any English, and from what I can gather, her patient has some kind of lower back affliction. The treatment involves the application of these suction cups, and it apparently works as a form of massage. After the whole arrangement is pretty well talked up, the patient cannot really do much else and has to lie still and wait for the full benefit of the treatment to kick in. Chinese medicine also relies heavily on acupuncture, a multitude of herbal remedies and the odd bloodletting. One particularly unpleasant treatment is a scraping of skin with a porcelain spoon or coin until a thick red welt is raised for things that we normally just pop a tablet for. <laughs> Dr. Lee's main speciality seems to be foot massage. Judging by the zeal with which she gets stuck in, it is hard to discern whether these are sketches of bruised feet or medical diagrams. While she and her assistant are knuckling their patient to better health, the girl with the mechanical leeches is nearing the end of her treatment and is quietly waiting for liberation. As the cups come off, big, red, nasty-looking blotches show up. They will soon disappear, and so will, one hopes, the soreness in her back. Funerals in Pingyao are huge affairs. As this procession makes its way through town, I cannot help but feel that it seems more a celebration of life than a mourning for someone that passed away. In a town that has miraculously managed to survive the wanton destruction of the old in favour of the new during the Cultural Revolution, it seems befitting to leave this life in such a celebratory manner. The capital of the People's Republic of China, Beijing, has seen extreme changes in the last 10 years. While this new face of prosperity threatens to turn Beijing into just another big world city, some things will always stay the same. Beijing duck is a famous delicacy that was invented here. Before it lands on your plate, the preparation starts on one of the farms outside Beijing, where the bird is fattened up by pumping it full of soybeans and grain. Eventually it gets roasted over a wood fire after being dipped in molasses, pumped up with air and filled with boiling water. Yeah. 
If you're able to look past the fact that it's been force-fed, it tastes delicious when served with little pancakes and a tangy sauce. Life in the Hutongs, or side streets, are more Spartan and few tourists ever come here. The Chinese have a big thing about losing face. This is the dark side of our life. Stop! They feel embarrassed about what goes on beyond the show of opulence. But flesh and money look the same the world over. What I'm more interested in is what goes on underneath. This, we are told, is the underground version of the Great Wall. As a remnant of the possible invasion by Russia in the late 60s, Mao Zedong decided to have this carved out beneath the capital as a shelter against air raids. In total, it took 2,000 people 10 years to complete the 32 kilometers of tunnels that are connected by 90 entrances scattered around the city above. In order to satisfy the pressing demand for space, the government has lately, in a rare show of flexibility, allowed some of it to be converted into spaces that people can now use. This underground textile factory producing and selling silk duvets is definitely one of a kind in the world. Although its domed roof looks quite sturdy, it is doubtful if it would have been able to withstand a nuclear attack. In spite of its thick walls and gas-proof doors, it is only a few meters below the surface, making it vulnerable to serious shock. But what it does succeed in is allowing me a mole's eye view of the city above. An estimated 14% of all people in Beijing are older than 65. They are surprisingly active, especially in the fresh early mornings when large groups congregate in parks strewn around the city for a few hours of Tai Chi. Unlike their Western counterparts, who tend to be less healthy, these people embrace life with rigorous workouts, some of which can look quite scary. Further along in the Warren is the Forbidden City. It is one of the landmarks in Beijing and its name comes from a time when no one was allowed in for 500 years. Emperors of both the Ming and Qing dynasties, who were loath to even poke their noses out the door, lived here in supreme luxury. On several occasions during its illustrious past, the whole place went up in royal flames. Today, enormous tour groups resembling volatile insurrections have joined the fray, making it hard to appreciate the elusive tranquility. My next stop is one of China's most well-known and infamous landmarks, Tiananmen Square. This huge slab of granite desert is the hub of Beijing and has in the past played host to major political protests and violent clashes. It is the creation of the great helmsman, Mao Zedong, who used it to review enormous parades of red guards who chanted and waved copies of his little red book called Quotations from Chairman Mao. Mao Zedong is still revered by most people, especially the poor, as a hero. Strangely, they are able to look past the fact that he presided over mass murder and devastation during the Cultural Revolution. When he died in 1976, millions crowded into the square to pay their last respects. Today, his gigantic mausoleum is visited by scores of people each day who give credence to the official party line that he was 70% right and only 30% wrong. It is from Tiananmen Gate that Chairman Mao proclaimed the People's Republic of China on the 1st of October 1949. Initial euphoria was soon replaced by vicious experiments in social reform, bloody purges and cultural devastation. During the early 80s, social discontent reached boiling point and the pressure cooker's lid shut off.
On the 4th of June 1989, the world looked on in horror as the army attacked a massive crowd of pro-democracy demonstrators, killing hundreds with machine gun fire and crushing many with charging tanks ordered by the government. Although China has become the whipping boy of the international press, enormous changes have taken place since 1989. China is booming and 100 million tourists on the lookout for backdrops come to Beijing annually. A visitor to Beijing, like myself, is bound to end up in Tiantan Park to marvel at the spectacular Ming architecture of the Temple of Heaven. On summer weekends, locals come here to socialize, get some sun and let off steam. Chinese opera is traditionally the domain of men, and wannabes come here to try their hand at singing, fueled by teas that the Chinese love so much. The unlimited varieties available are said to have potent qualities. After such a powerful display, I also try some before setting off on the next leg of our journey through China.